Hello everyone, my name is Prod de Silaos, also known as Prod. Uh, I am on my way to the old uh, vineyard where I will continue with my hut building uh, endeavors. Uh, I will uh, be setting up a fire today. Uh, I need to burn some of the accumulated biomass. Eventually I need to burn all of it so that I can uh, clear the land for construction work to continue from there. Of course, I am proceeding slowly, uh, one small step at a time, whenever the prevailing conditions uh, permit so. But uh, eventually I will get there. Uh, what I want to do in this video, though, is not talk about the hut, but instead do some philosophy. So now I am climbing a mountain, by the way, and it's also getting warm, so it's uh, quite tricky to do this. Anyhow, so I want to do philosophy. And the topic I want to expound on is uh, one of impossible standards. Impossible standards for our life. Impossible standards that we want to live by, yet cannot, cannot actualize. And because we cannot actualize them, we always live with a sense of being disempowered, a sense of being incomplete, inadequate, unworthy, monke. These standards are passed down to us by people who are otherwise wise, people who are otherwise exceptionally smart. But those people Maybe they failed to explain something very, very important, which is what I call the scope of application. The scope of application is uh, my concept for describing the context, the case where an abstraction or a model, more generally, holds uh, true and is descriptive. For example, 1 plus 1 equals 2. This is an abstraction, because if I have one human and then one uh, smartphone, that equals 2 of what? It doesn't equal 2 of something that I can use. Or, for example, if I want to go, you know, pay the bills, and they say, okay, you have to pay 10 euro. I have to have 10 euro, I don't have to have 10 of whatever. So I cannot say, okay, you know what, I have 10 ideas, here you have it. That would be useful for me, of course, uh, but uh, it wouldn't work in practice. Because 10 as such and 10 euro as such are two completely different things. They exist at different scopes of application. We have to be mindful of the scope of application, otherwise we will err, and we will err lamentably, and we will suffer the consequences of that. But let's take a step back. Before I continue with this idea, uh, let me tell you about the Golden Fleece. Let me tell you in a few words about Jason and the Argonauts. This is an ancient Greek myth which I think captures a sentiment, a feeling, a longing that we modern folks have as well. A longing for the killer app. A longing for that solution which will elevate us to great heights. Jason and uh, the crew and the Argonauts venture on an open-ended quest to find and... Uh, to bring back home the Golden Fleece. The Golden Fleece is basically the promise of a better life. It's basically the promise of something that would otherwise be unattainable for those heroes. So they expect to have a good life as a result of this adventure. Instead, what happens is that they are met with uh, misfortune with loss, with tragedy, with great suffering. The story ends 
with uh, the wife of uh, Jason killing her children. And uh, Jason himself asking the god, Zeus, to take away his life. Because his life was not worth living anymore. It was too burdensome. The pain was excruciating. It was simply too much for him. So you have the Argonauts in this quest for something that is supposed to be great. Something that will give them everything their heart desires. Yet this something, this quest, this longing is their undoing. This longing is what kills them. In the case of uh, Jason, literally. And in other cases also metaphorically, it kills them inside. We have this in our everyday life. We know about the golden fleece. We all know about it. We all know about it when we discount or underappreciate what we have, whether it is a tool or another person. And we say, oh no, this is not good enough for me. I want something, you know, much better. I want uh, the greatest, the greatest of the greatest. And I will not... Uh, compromise on this and I will not uh, have anything less than that so you let go of what you have and you search your golden fleece and maybe you will be lucky and you will find it but what most uh, often is the case is that you will not find it and you will meet the fate of Jason metaphorically at least I get this specifically, this golden fleece example, with uh, Emacs. Emacs, in case you don't know, in case you uh, haven't followed my other content, Emacs is an advanced program. It looks like a text editor, it works like a text editor, but fundamentally it is a programmable text editor, let's call it like this. It is a programmable computing environment that you can do great great things with it the difficulty with emacs is that to unleash its power you have to invest time to learn how it works you have to work the emacs way for you to uh, reach uh, its potential because if you come here if you go into emacs with uh, biases with prejudices expecting for it to behave the way everything else behaves well you won't uh, have a nice experience and then you will go on some forum and complain about how difficult this thing is which is difficult but um, because you didn't give it a fair chance anyway the thing is that uh, the golden fleece i get is that we have this idea like okay i want to switch to emacs because emacs itself will elevate my productivity because now I can use for example org mode or Magit or whatever this is partially true Emacs has some what we would call killer apps some applications that are really great when you get to use them and when you understand what they are doing and uh, you um, organize your workflow um, based on them but they are not magic. You still have to put in the effort. You still have to know what you are doing. If you are opportunistic about it, it simply won't work. They won't read your mind. They won't understand what it is that you are trying to do. And more importantly, even if they could read your mind, you would have to have a clear mind. You would have to have a clear understanding of what it is that you want to do which is not as easy as it sounds. Oftentimes we have desires that we have not elucidated, that we have not clarified, and we have a faint notion of what it is that we want, but this faint notion has not yet been rendered concrete, has not been made clear. So even if you had somehow Emacs reading your mind, it still would read something that is incomplete. So the golden fleece, as it is expressed when I see it, 
is uh, along the lines of should I use this or should I use that to be productive? And it's, um, uh, it is presented in those general terms. And the answer is, well, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't know what you are asking exactly, if you don't know what you are wishing for, you won't get what you are wishing for. It's that simple. You might get it out of sheer luck, but not because it was uh, uh, what, you, what was your uh, original plan. It wasn't uh, something that you actually uh, achieved. It was something that simply came at find you and found you. For example, I have this uh, package for Emacs called Denote. Denote implements a file naming scheme, which is not a program per se, it's an idea. So you can uh, follow the file naming scheme without any program, which is what I was doing before. Part of what the node does is to create nodes using that file naming scheme. So it's a very low tech, as it were, approach to writing notes and uh, storing your knowledge and then linking between your notes and so on. So I have these questions from time to time, like, should I use Denote? Should I use OrgRom, which is an excellent uh, package in, in the Emacs uh, ecosystem? Should I use OrgRom? Should I use uh, a third party, another application uh, outside of Emacs? Because uh, I want to be super productive and I want this to work for for me for the future. And again, the answer is you are simply not phrasing the question properly. You are an outsider. You have not done any work and you are thinking about how productive you will be uh, 10 years from now. This is immaterial because you cannot develop the right intuitions for as long as you are an outsider because you are not actually working with the thing to see what its strengths are, what its weaknesses are, what it actually does for you, what it misses in your opinion. Without those specific details, you cannot really say anything that is meaningful. So your quest for the golden fleece will end in your ruin, your ruin metaphorically. I don't say that you will uh, have any great uh, suffering, any great loss, but you will be, for example, unproductive. And not only you will be unproductive in general, you will also feel bad about yourself because you will say, oh, look, the years go by and I am not do actually doing stuff. I'm not actually doing anything. Why is that? And the answer is, my friend, because you are searching for the golden fleece. And the golden fleece is not actually golden. It is a, it is a curse. It is something that is not good for you. We have to be able, oh, just a second, because there are, there is mud here. Let me see what I can do about it. So we have to be, ooh, ouch. Hopefully, okay, that's not too bad. So we have to be, to see the myths, to see the ancient myths, to be able to see what the morale of the story is. Of course, there are lots of embellishments and lots of, other details of the story that we can safely omit from our understanding of the myth because fundamentally we don't care about the myth per se we care about the teachings we care about what we can learn today this is not just a story for entertainment uh, even though that is valuable as well but this is a story that has some didactic value something that we can make use of in present uh, time so we have to be uh, mindful of that. Let me then return to what I was saying about impossible standards. Because impossible standards are a bit like the golden fleece. Oh, a car is coming. So hopefully they will not interrupt me. Maybe I can take a detour. I don't know where they are going. So maybe I will take a detour towards where they are going. So anyway, let me keep going straight and Let's not worry about it. 
Anyway, the impossible standards are a bit like the golden fleece in the sense that we have them and we aspire towards those standards. But because we don't have a sense of the scope of application, we cannot actually implement them in our life. And because we cannot actually implement them, we feel bad about it. We feel bad and we say, okay, look, I am simply not good enough. Let me give you a concrete example. You may have uh, watched some of my previous uh, videos where I comment on the book uh, Tao Te Ching by the ancient Chinese philosopher Lao Zi. Lao Zi talks about sages. This is a key word in the book. And he says stuff like sages are indifferent. And uh, sages, you know, um, decide in this or that uh, way. And they govern in this or that way uh, by not acting and that sort of thing. The way Lao Zi uses the term sages is as a proxy for Tao, for this abstract concept which stands for being. So Tao is all that is, but it is so abstract that it doesn't have a way of being, as I have explained. I don't want to go into the technicalities right now. The point, the point is that the way Lao Zi uses the concept of sages, it cannot apply to human beings. Because human beings cannot be the Tao. Human beings cannot be the Tao because human beings exist in some way. Exist in a very specific way that is outside their control. To be like the Tao, you must not exist in a certain way. You must simply exist. But then you are no longer human. Specifically, we have this idea that you should treat everybody, everything equally. So you should be indifferent. You should, be, you should have no preference whatsoever. If you take this literally, this is absolutely impossible. So the car is coming through this way? No, they are going that way. Great. So if you take it uh, literally... Oh, there's a stray dog as well. What is happening here? Oh, the car is coming this way after all. Uh, and there is some more mud here. So, let's see what is happening. Sorry about this, folks. Uh, this is what happens with windows that are impromptu. Uh, let's uh, wait for it to pass. Let's uh, wait for them. Okay, they are slow as well. So, basically, they are just uh, delaying my point. Uh, but what do we have to do? We have to wait. Ow. I scratch myself. So we have to wait, we have to be uh, patient. Uh, oh my goodness, I am faster on foot than they are with the car. What is happening? Uh, okay, I will say the point and then uh, whatever. So Lao Zi makes this uh, statement like sages are indifferent to everything because the Tao is indifferent, you know? And the thing is, okay, so you are indifferent towards everything, okay? So, do you eat? Because your nature as a human being conditions you in this state where you have to seek food, you have to eat. It's not a matter of choice. Because if you don't eat, you are simply dead. Now you say, okay, I can choose to die. But then, of course, what's the wisdom in that? Just go die and... Uh, Tell us how it was. What was the wise thing about? And even then, you don't have the choice again. Even then, you don't have the choice of whether you can um, choose to eat or not, because that is secondary to the fact that your human condition involves eating, involves the consumption of food. Whether you actually consume it, that is secondary. The mechanism is there from before. So you cannot be indifferent because that is simply impossible. For you to be indifferent, you will have to not be a human. 
you will have to be something else. What that is, is irrelevant. But you will not be what you now are. So if you are following the precept without qualifying it, if you are following it like that, and if you say, okay, I have to be indifferent, you know, everything that happens in my life, I will have to just accept it. I won't have opinions. I won't have desires. I won't have anything. And uh, therein lies wisdom. And therein lies no wisdom whatsoever. Therein lies the golden fleece, which is your demise. The reason it is your demise is that you will be tolerating the intolerable. You will be accepting the something that you should not be accepting. And you will pretending that you have no preferences when you are actually preferring to follow the precept of Laozi. And I say, why? Why do that to yourself? Why go through all that suffering? Venture on that quest, Jason style for what ultimately is nothing, for what ultimately is not a good outcome. As human beings, we have many facets to our presence. We have many facets to our actuality. We understand, for example, beauty. We see nature, we can sing, we can make love. So we understand that. But we also understand, for example, war. We understand what rage means. We understand what conflict is. What it means to struggle for survival. We understand harmony. We understand discord. We understand all those different facets of our condition, of our being. And we know that they are all there. And we know that we cannot avoid them completely from uh, the human condition because they are not part of our choice. They are predetermined. They are there before volition comes into play. The capacity is there from before. So I say, why have an ideal that is not actually about humans? Why have an ideal that is about gods? If you replace the word sages with God, then everything makes sense it's in Laozi's precept. God has no preference. Fine. God can do this. God can do that. Fine. God is omniscient and thus will not be biased. But I am not omniscient. So I will be biased by virtue of being ignorant. I will be biased because my partial knowledge, knowledge shows me something and obscures something else. So there is value judgment in that. There is belief in that. There is the hope that what I am doing is correct. But I don't actually know. So why have an ideal? Why have a standard about what God does? I don't care. I'm not God. I need a standard for me. I need a standard for the human condition. I need a standard that understands the multifacetedness of the human condition. That understands the fact that I can appreciate beauty and wisdom and discord and uh, struggle. And all those things that we know about in our life, we all know about them. These are not just uh, concepts that some uh, philosopher comes up with and we have to, you know, go out of our way to understand them. Everybody understands those concepts. They are part of the human condition. If we are having an impossible standard then, we are simply setting up ourselves uh, for failure, setting ourselves up for failure. We are simply um, holding a standard that is not guiding us to where we should be going. It's again the golden fleece. 
It's again this desire, this longing to elevate ourselves, to exalt ourselves in ways that are otherwise not uh, feasible. And yet this longing, when it is not couched in terms of practical reason, in terms of practicality, is leading to our undoing. Why do I mention the multifacetedness of the human condition? I do it because I think, I learn, I have learned through trial and error to appreciate what the ancient Delphic maxims say. The ancient Delphic maxims are three. One is to know yourself. To know yourself, you cannot know yourself in abstract because you do not have a standalone presence. To know yourself, you have to be in the world, mindful of what is happening around you, dubitative, inquisitive, to understand what your surroundings are, to understand what your place is, to compare yourself with others. It is how yourself is um, substantiated. It's not something that can be understood independent of the case that informs, frames, conditions, or otherwise determines it. So know yourself is the first maxim. Know yourself, so learn about yourself by learning about the world. The second maxim is nothing in excess. So when you do things, don't go to extremes. Don't be an extremist. Try to find the midpoint. Move towards the midpoint. The middle way between uh, the extremes. Because even if something is good for you, for example, water. Water is good for us, okay? We need water to survive. But if we drink too much water, if you drink something ridiculous, like, I don't know, 20 liters per day, that is harmful, that is bad for you. Same with uh, vinegar. If you have, like, a little bit of it in your salad, that makes for a good salad. If you add a liter of it, well, that will kill you, I don't know. But it's definitely not good for you. Same for everything. So this is something we know through trial and error in our life, to try to avoid the extremes. It works. It is a precept that works. So that's the second maxim of uh, the Oracle of Delphi, of the Temple of Apollo in Delphi. And the third maxim is that certainty stands beside ruin. So don't be too sure about yourself. Don't take yourself too seriously. Remember the fact that you are human. Remember, more specifically, the fact that you are not omniscient. The fact that you are fallible. The fact that you are biased all the time. Not sometimes, all the time. You are always biased. You cannot be unbiased completely. Because that requires omniscience. And you are not omniscient. Be mindful of that. And don't be too sure about what it is that you are doing. Because when you are too sure, you will be reckless. When you are absolutely certain about your plans, your stratagems, your schemes in life, if you think that everything will go your way, well, things uh, will not go your way. Because next to this certainty is exactly ruin. In the original formulation of the maxim, it is the goddess of ruin. So certainty stands beside the goddess of ruin. But that does not matter. The point is the same. So these three Delphic maxims teach us stuff that are practical in our life. Teach us stuff that are about humans, not about so-called sages, not about gods. Gods can have their own rules. 
But that's up to them, it's not up to us. When we bring things down a notch, when we understand the scope of application, when we understand that some abstractions have to be particularized for us to be useful, for us to make sense of them in our everyday life. So when we bring things down a notch in this way, we no longer suffer from the impossibility, from the unattainability of the standard. Because now we can follow what we set out as our uh, guiding light. We can follow it, yes. And it will actually improve our life. To not be an extremist, that will improve your life. To understand that you are um, in the world. You cannot uh, just detach yourself from the world. So you must work with what is available with what the prevailing conditions render possible. If you expect something that is not part of this actuality, you will simply be expecting something that is impossible for you. And you will be suffering. Whereas once you accept the world, once you accept yourself, once you no longer have the need to prove anything to anyone, you relieve yourself from that burden. You emancipate yourself from that falsehood, that desire to do things in accordance with some standard, uh, some arbitrary standard. And you understand that you are flawed. You understand that you will not take yourself too seriously. So you will allow yourself the chance, the right to be wrong, the right to be proven wrong, and that's fine. I don't need to be correct all the time, at all times, and I will feel insecure about it. If I make a mistake, oh my goodness, that's the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. That's part of our nature. It's okay. It's okay to admit that you are human. It's perfectly fine. That's what you are. And that implies that you are fallible. That implies that you make mistakes all the time. And that's okay. Admit it. It's not a problem. And in admitting it, find relief. See how light your life is afterwards. This is what I want from wisdom. This is what I want from philosophy. I don't want to read about sages and what sages do in some uh, god-like realm. I don't care. I am not a sage in that regard. I am not a god. I want to know about humans. I want to know about this being. This being that on uh, one day can be singing and dancing and making love, and on another day is uh, readying itself for war. I want to learn about this being, not about gods, not about sages. And I want to understand that what I have is what is there, and I will accept it. And I will not search in my life at all times for the golden fleece, that which will elevate me to some great, some lofty heights. It will elevate me and then I can come down crashing. I don't actually want that. So I have to be able to formulate my desires in a clear way. And usually this means to not ask for too much, not expect too much. Don't... Uh, don't think that you are too good, because you are not. Lower the standards. Lower the standards, my friend. Have standards, but uh, keep them within practical uh, usefulness. Practical reasonableness, as we say. And when they are practical like that, you will feel okay with yourself, first and foremost.
and you will be okay, you will be fine with whatever your condition is. Conditions such as this, what I am doing now, so I have to go do this work, it's what it is, what can we do about it? That's all for today folks, thank you very much for your attention, take care and remember what happens to Jason, Jason in the myth and remember not to uh, have the same fate, so I just need to put this down to close this, goodbye folks, take care.